Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I'm your host, Benedict Tyne. If you are new to the show, welcome. If you're already a listener, thank you for coming back. Today, we're talking about a message that I got from a coaching student, and it really made me think. So the message was, I just wanted to say thank you. It's great to have someone who is so unrelentingly positive and upbeat as part of this. Whether we are talking on Zoom, group chat, your video messages, or even the podcast, your positivity comes through all of it and makes it feel like what we're doing in brackets music is possible and maybe even fun sometimes. So while I love and appreciate this message, of course, um, it also made me think and reflect on that whole topic of music being fun. You know, a lot of artists and DIY producers that I work with and talk to, they sometimes seem to forget their why and like why they even got into this, why they wanted to write and produce their own music in the first place. And I've been there too. When we get, I think when we get ambitious and dive deep into learning something, improving our skills and trying to reach the goals that we set for ourselves, we can get disconnected from the art. And it all turns into projects and tasks and deadlines and schedules and a long list of to-dos. So how can we separate the to-dos from the process of actually creating art and make sure we enjoy making music? This is what we talk uh, about today. And as always, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. Hello, Malcolm. How are you? Hey, Benny. I'm great, man. How are you? I'm great, too. Thank you. Awesome. This time, I well, actually want to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to... to I, I realized as you were explaining that you got a question from one of your students that some people might be like, what do you mean, students? Are okay, we all yeah. students if we listen to the podcast? <laughs> yeah, you're right. And you're uh, right. you, I mean, if you consider yourself a student by listening to the podcast, that's great. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Yeah. And um, yeah. we're super happy you're learning. But uh, you can take things a lot further with Benny. Um, Benny has probably mentioned if, on an episode that you've listened to that he offers like a free one-on-one -on -one coaching call. And he offers that on an ongoing basis, plus a lot more, plus like a whole academy of video lessons and stuff like that. Uh, for people that want to level up their recording skills really quick and and in a very thorough, comprehensive way. So that is what Benny's talking about when he mentions that you know one of his students reached out to him. To thank you for that, Malcolm. Totally. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a member of the Self-Recording Syndicate. It's what the coaching program is called. And uh, yeah, totally. That's right. And I mean, I love getting these messages. And um, it's obviously great that 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 I, I'm, I was able to motivate and, and be positive and, you know, encourage people in there. But also, as I said, made me think because um, music should be fun, right? And, and then, so yeah. that's why we, why we wanted to talk to about this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, but before we do that, this time, actually, for once, I can start the banter um, because you can expect some more running banter in the future, I guess. Again, it's been a while. <laughs> but like, it's, it's getting no warm escape. here. <laughs> yeah, it's getting warm here. Like, you know, spring is here. I'm not at all in winter mode anymore. There's still m snow in the mountains, but I don't care. I'm in summer mode. And I actually... You know, last year I signed up for my first ultra marathon, which is like every, everything longer than a marathon is considered an ultra marathon. And I signed up for one last year, which was 68K um, in, in like 68 kilometers and 2,500 2, meters of elevation gain. And I prepared for that and I was ready. And then shortly before the race, I got injured and wasn't, was barely able to walk for weeks and, and couldn't run anymore. But I just signed up for it again this year, and now training right. begins, and I'm not going to give up. So I'm going to keep you updated on that journey. There's a couple of prep races in between. I'm going to do a half marathon and a road marathon, and then maybe another road marathon in late fall. So it's like a pretty pretty crazy race schedule this year. And uh, I just try to test the limits of my body, I guess, this year, and I will not give up. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, that's if you weren't already testing the limits of your body. <laughs> just, you just keep going. It's amazing. Yeah. I can't imagine running that far. Um, I, everybody knows I also run, but I'm like the mini me version of Benny when it comes to distance. <laughs> yeah, but you're, fa but you're fast though. You got fast in the last couple of years, I feel like. When we first started talking about it, you, your runs were pretty, I mean, you know, hobby level slow sort of thing. But then all of a sudden there were some races where I thought, ooh, like he's getting, he's getting fast. And that's not my strength, really. I just I can go long and I can suffer for a long time. That's probably my biggest strength. <laughs> but I'm not that fast. Uh, but you are, so uh, it, it's just about fun for me. I uh, 
I, I I do want to do some some races this year, but um, but for the most part, I just want to keep getting out there. I've got a a, a TV show that I'm working on coming up, um, pretty soon. That starts soon. I'm, I'm not allowed to say what it is, but it requires a lot of running. So I've been training quite hard for that. Just trying oh, to get out cool. like a, a four times a week if I can. Um, keeping the distances pretty short because it's all about. Uh, fitness and not injury. <laughs> yeah, 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 and sort of a strength endurance thing where it's like, yeah, 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 totally get it. Yeah, um, we'll see <laughs> how that goes this year. <laughs> yeah, that's that. That was my banter. Uh, any, I don't know, any music related banter? <laughs> yeah, we had a question we wanted to ask the audience, and uh, to be completely honest, it's it's left my brain. What were we going to ask them? Any? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what we wanted to ask them. Uh, you're right. Thank you for reminding me. So, so um, we were talking about, like you were telling me that some bands recently, like Friends of Yours, got grants, like recording grants, like money from the government to help fund recording projects, right? And uh, so we thought this could be a great topic, actually, for an episode, because funding is a problem for many bands. It, depending on how big the project is, it can be become pretty expensive pretty quickly. And in many countries, there is ways to get support and um, to get money uh, from from the government to help you bring these projects to life. And so we know some, like we know a Canadian, like a friend of yours, Malcolm, is an expert on this when it comes to Canada and maybe in general how to apply for those things and what to uh, include in like an application and stuff. So we could bring uh, like a person like that on uh, to the podcast. But then we also realized that it's probably very different in like different parts of the world. And if you know something about that topic, like you, the listener, I'm talking to you right now. If you know anything about that topic, or maybe your band got grants at, at some point, you know how it works in your country, uh, and you can help us out with info on that, we really appreciate that. So uh, please reach out to us um, and use the email podcast at the com. So just send us an email there, reach out to us, and uh, let us know. Or you can you know send us a DM on Instagram, whatever, but like the email is probably the most streamlined way of doing it. And um, let us know. We, we'd love to mention you and your band on the podcast, and if you have valuable info for us, we'll include that. And maybe we can get enough info so that we can cover like a couple of countries or you know uh, specific things for specific people to make the episode even more valuable and so yeah that was it I think. yeah yeah i think uh if, if that sounds like something you'd like to learn more about we can definitely make that happen so but just yeah. let us know if it's what you're interested in because it's it's outside of our normal scope of uh diy recording for um you know self-recording bands so we'd oh, love yeah. to know if that's something that actually interests you Oh yeah, that that too. Not just exactly. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, don't just uh, reach out if you know something about this, but also let us know if you actually want this because and where you're from. Because then we can maybe do the, some research or like ask people from your country if they know something about it. So that would really uh, help us too. So just reach out. Let us know if that is interesting. Maybe for this, it makes sense to do a community forum kind of post um, in our Facebook community where people can chime in with if they're interested and what they know about and where they're from. So we can really get some data going into this episode. That'd be very helpful, I think. So Great if you are idea. not already part of our Facebook community, this is yet another reminder to go join that the self-recording band, uh, facebook.com slash the self-recording band community. Is that right? Just go to the self recording band.com slash community and that will redirect you to the Facebook uh, yeah. group. Yeah. I knew there was one. <laughs> yeah. Or, or just search the self recording band on Facebook and you'll find it. But like the direct link is the self recording band.com slash community. Um, speaking of community, I mean, not to put like too many calls to actions in one episode uh, here, but um, at some point, and you don't have to do this right now, uh, but at some point we're going to uh, do a little poll again, also reach out to you about the community because. You know, every year or so, I want to know if that is actually still relevant or we should move to Discord or, you know, some other medium or whatever. You know, but that's a whole thing for another day. Uh, but for now, it is the, the Facebook group still. So just join us. And if that changes anytime soon, that's why I'm saying it, you'll you'll know when you're in there. Like, we'll yeah. let you know. Cool. Let's get to today's episode then. So we talked about like the, the what and, and why we feel like this is important. Now, just let's go through some ways that we can think of um, that could help you, like, uh, yeah, m you know, make music fun again, sort of. And, and uh, you know, it, actually, it's kind of weird that, that we have to do this, but I, it's also, I totally get it, because I've been there myself, too. You know, you, you, you'd think that music in and of itself is fun. But, you know, it can also, it, 
sometimes if it's a big project or like it is something that is hard, um, it can turn into tedious tasks and we kind of forget about that it's fun. So, so what can we do to bring that back and to, to make sure we enjoy it? It's so important. I know there are some people listening to this that haven't got into to musical burnout yet mm. <laughs> and hopefully ever but I'm also positive that there's a lot of people that have yeah. and there's a point where you take music so seriously that it stops being about fun at all and it all it's it, it's purely business and and the pursuit of achievement and um, progress and whatever your goals are uh, and that can be really powerful because mm. for me when I've got like tangible goals, <laughs> you know, like this many people in a room, this many streams, this many sales, this many songs recorded by this date, those tangible deadlines and, and goals make it a lot easier to accomplish. But if you do that too long and with too much focus, all of the fun gets like drained out of it. <laughs> and then you are left with something you don't enjoy anymore. And if you hit burnout hard enough, there, I know people that have fully quit music and have never come back, which is terrifying to think. Imagine, like, you're right now you are listening to two nerds talk about recording music because we love it so much, and you obviously must love it too because we talk for like an hour at a time with 10 minutes of, about running before we even get to the music <laughs> stuff. So you must really love music. So it would be so sad for you to stop loving music and, mm. and to quit. Um, and that is what will happen if you if you don't get this right. If you don't mm -hmm. keep loving music and uh, the art of making it, of playing it, um, uh, the the kind of like sister and brotherhood of, of jamming and working with teams, it's it's so important. So uh, th like this feels very close to my heart because my band's been on a high like indefinite hiatus for a couple of years now. Mine and <laughs> I had no interest in playing music at all. Like even jamming with friends until like weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> Just totally. a matter of weeks ago, I've started jamming for fun again, which is crazy. That's like two years of not wanting to play music. Wild. To totally. I, I can totally relate. Uh, it's the same for my band, my like my original band that I've had for years. Um, we're still on a on a hiatus sort of. And, um, uh, and, and it, it didn't bother me, like it bothered me in the beginning, but then it didn't bother me because of the same thing. I didn't even want to play music anymore. And now I'm in a, since I'm in a new band, it was kind of hard to get into it. And I was very careful and I actually I wanted to do with like minimal effort. And, but I, I thought like some, something inside me told me that like, you probably should do this. And, and it's like, I need a band. I need to be in a band. I cannot be not in a band, sort of. <laughs> um, and so I just did it. And and now I rediscovered how much fun it actually is. And part of it was playing these first shows and interacting with people again around the the show and on, in the venue and all of that. That was part of it for me. And like I, I rediscovered it. And and turns out not not just that. In the process of like working on our songs and like talking to the bandmates about like mu music that we love or new records that come out, things I haven't really done so much the last couple of years, uh, I find myself also listening to music more again. I didn't do that too because I was listening to music all day in the studio and so I mainly listened to podcasts and audiobooks and all of that. But for some reason, I'm back into music in general again. And um, so it can be done. It's just a a sort of a, a burnout thing that you have to go through, I think, and then um, and, and kind of yeah, but it, it can be done. You can you can come back and and it's actually so sad that this even happens. Yeah, yeah, and and ideally, if you listen to this podcast and and pay attention, you skip the burnout entirely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the goal. Exactly. <laughs> and and to be fair, like I, I I was always working on music and still enjoying it. I didn't have like complete you know creative or music burnout. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do my job. It was just too much, and I forgot my own sort of outlet and like that it's fun for me to to make music uh, myself. So anyway, um, I think it all starts by, you know, being clear about what you want to accomplish because you probably don't need to do all the things you see other people do. What I mean by that is that everyone has different goals. You know, some of us are very ambitious. Some of us see music as a career. Others just want to make music for themselves or their friends or family or just, you know, here and there is a, like a recreational thing, hobby, you know, whatever. And that is totally fine. And if you are not that ambitious and you don't, if that, if you don't have like business goals basically with your music, then you don't need to do every single thing that all the ambitious people tell you to do or that you see online. Maybe it's okay to just do a little bit when you feel like it, you know, and like no one's going to judge you and, and you're going to have more fun. And I, I've 
talked to quite a few people who feel like it's too much and they they feel like they have to do all these things in order to to record their music and i'm always like you know but what what for if you don't you know like you don't you don't have to do it all like so that's i think what what it starts with like be clear about your about what you want to accomplish if you are ambitious however if you want to become successful with your music in any way then it's it's not going to be easy so you that's just the reality of it but still it can be fun uh, but it all starts with knowing what you actually want to do i think yeah i used to run a podcast another podcast called your band sucks at business it's still up there if anybody wants to check it out um and there actually might be very sporadic new episodes coming out <laughs> cool. um, but it, like not going to be a consistent thing anytime soon for sure um but we yeah we talked about the you know the business side of running a band and a lot of both a lot of the topics were about releasing music effectively and you know having a bunch of digital assets prepped you know a music video uh you know promo photos single mm. art um have you like sent it out to radio people ahead of release to music blogs or whatever you know there's there's literally unlimited things you could do and yeah. what i started finding <laughs> was happening was bands that were about to release their first song um, like didn't even have a Spotify page at this point. You know, their brand new bands were messaging me, being like, "And and what else? And what else? And what else? And 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 like, oh, I can't release a song yet because I haven't done this." Oh, yeah. And it, it, it's like, well, more is always going to be more. So there's always going to be more to be done, and potentially that could equal more success for that song. But it'll never stop. So <laughs> yeah, it, you have to eventually just just go and and, and actually do it um, and <laughs> and be satisfied with you did what you could and what was reasonable. So it, it doesn't mean you should always do everything because you actually can't do everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, to totally. It absolutely makes sense. Um, it's oftentimes and like that like we always said an advice buffet sort of thing and. Um, sometimes it takes a whole. T it would take a whole team to do all the things, you know. And mm -hmm. so you, you don't, yeah, you don't have to do it all. But if you want, it will never stop. There's always more to do, as you said. Like you, you know, you can always do more, and that will, if you do it right, lead to more results. But it all comes down to what you actually want to accomplish and how much you actually can do with the time you have without yeah. burning out. And it is the same in this podcast in a way too. Um, in that, yeah. like, there's always, you know further steps you could take and if your brain is working against you if you're uber maybe overly detail orientated you might keep redoing your guitar parts because you hear a little squeak and let me tell you there's always going to be a squeak <laughs> yeah it's okay that For there's sure a squeak there in your is. guitar yeah. track <laughs> exactly exactly yeah so um yeah let, let, let's dive into like uh, like some more actionable things that you can do i'd say um, part of it that works for me, at least, is to separate the prep work from the actual sessions and actually making music. Um, this is something I do in the studio, too, where I try to make sure that I have different sort of, I'm in a different sort of state of, of mind when I when I mix versus when I prepare sessions or, you know, fix something in the studio. So, um the better you, the better prepared you are when you actually sit down to just make music. The more fun it's going to be because then you don't have to think about all those things that you forgot, and then this is not working, and you know you have to look up another thing. And before you know it, your time is basically over, and you haven't really made music. You just you were just troubleshooting. So um, I would separate the two. Uh, it's the same thing like when when I track bands at the studio. And I knew that we were tracking drums, for example, which takes a long time to set up and prepare. I would always make sure that the band would come in the day before and we would spend like half a day or so setting up the drums, tuning, changing heads and like moving mics around and all the nerdy shit. And then when we were, do when we were done with that, we would just call it a day and then come back in fresh the next day. And everyone was excited to just start recording right away versus what I did in the beginning was to the band came in in the morning. We spent half the day setting up and then nobody felt like making music anymore. So if you can separate the preparation from the actual session, that just helps. And then uh, it's two different, you know, it's got to be done, but like it's two different things. And it and the, the whole prep work and troubleshooting doesn't cause you to, to not enjoy making music anymore, basically, if you separate it. Yeah. Yeah, this could be applied to your rehearsals as well. You know, if you're if you're doing band meetings every week at your rehearsals, ha like maybe set that to be the end of the 
jam. So you just show up, you play music, and then you talk, or vice versa, like whatever system works for you. But don't just kind of have it flip flopping, like in between each song, you stop playing music and you have a serious chat. It just is going to grind kind of like everything to a halt. It's going to take people out of enjoying the playing because they're just now stressing out about whatever was just talked about um, in the band meeting. There's yeah, it, like the more you can batch things and uh, isolate the type of activity, I think the better. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Another thing that I do is like to to separate the practicing from actually writing and performing and recording, and also to set aside time to improve your workflow and skills. And what I mean by that is I do that with mixing too. Like I'm not practicing or trying new tools or improving my my tools or workflow while I'm working on the sessions for my the artists I'm working with, right? So when I do that, I focus on the, the things that I already know that I feel comfortable with and I'm focused fully on the music and the creative parts of it and the emotion and all of that. And I don't try new plugins or, I mean, every now and again I do because I need something, but usually I try to stick with what I already feel comfortable with just so I can fully focus on the music. And then I set aside time to improve my skills, to learn new plugins, to improve the workflow at the studio. And I do that separately. So so that then I can I can apply what I've learned in that session to my actual sessions, if that makes sense. Instead of doing it all all the time and then nothing really, you know, um, if that makes sense. So I think there is a benefit to that. So if you're struggling with certain features of your DAW, for example, maybe just you know set aside some time to just practice that to figure that out, and then and not and don't do it while you actually just you know want to record that song now, uh, and in that way. I think it's much more enjoyable and you can be more present and focused on the music, which is always more fun. So Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. When you're first starting out learning to record yourself, it feels like it is an impossibly slow process and that it's just impossible to finish like a whole song because it takes so long to do everything. But that is just because you're not very fluent with knowing your recording gear and your software um, for that process. So it's just a matter of getting good at it. Uh, Almost every industry agrees on this, that you should never try out a new piece of gear on a real gig. <laughs> you know, you always yeah. want to plug it in the night before at the very least and and play with it and, and figure out how it works before you're actually on the job site. Um, so if you think of the actual recording session with your band as the job site, just make sure you get to play with whatever you're doing before then as much as possible. Yeah. Exactly. Preparation is so important in general. And and, mm -hmm. uh, and and being in the right... I think everything's more enjoyable if you're fully focused. I think that's part of it too. It just gets frustrating when your mind's all over the place and you feel like you don't, you're don't you not getting anywhere and it's overwhelming. I feel the more you can focus on one thing, the more you enjoy it and you can go really deep and you know, and then you, you, you solve that problem and next time you can focus on something different. And when you want, when you work on music, you can be fully present with the music. And I think that's just that's just a good thing in general. So, yeah. Um, the other thing is, it might sound obvious. Um, the next thing here is listen to music you love and and as well as like new music, just discover new artists and, and find joy in that and, and like have fun with that and let it inspire you, you know, just that's something I forgot to do for a long time, really. I just stuck to, you know, my reference playlists and, and of course like friends bands and the stuff that I was working on. But it has been a while since I really started to just discover new bands again, listen to like playlists on Spotify and just see what comes up. And then every once in a while I'd be like, that sounds interesting. Who is that? And I'd, I'd love to know who did that. And when, you know, and that inspires me and, that, and that's just, just fun. And then I immediately have this sort of spark where I hear something exciting that I haven't heard before. And immediately my brain goes, I got to try to make a sound like that. And, and I'm looking forward to the session now. And now it's fun because I have something that I'm excited about that I want to do, you know? So that is definitely a way I think to, to bring back some of the fun. Yeah, a, a trick for me when it came to writing music was always learning new music. So every time I would learn mm -hmm. a new song, it was like, oh, this is like a new approach or a new style. And that would give me ideas and I'd end up stumbling upon a riff, you know, as a result. It was like the quickest way to come up with song ideas was to learn somebody else's song. It's fascinating. Totally. And I mean, we don't, we can't reinvent it anyways. Like it's always, you know, you draw on what's been done before and you put your own twist to it and and, and, and on it and um, make it your own. and. and and further develop what's already there, but it's unlikely that you can uh, invent something completely new. So we need this inspiration anyways. Yeah, totally. And and so much of 
music is muscle memory. So mm -hmm. you might not even realize it, but you fall into these patterns of like you know, what frets you're playing or, or what rhythms you're playing, strumming patterns. So by learning a different one, uh, it, it just kind of like expands what's possible in your brain. Yeah, to totally. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, and the next one sounds very simple too here is just jam. Um, and I've, I think you have done that lately, Malcolm, where you don't, you know, you have a session without any agenda and without any plan or any, you know, things to do. You just sit down and jam. And if nothing comes yeah. out of it, that's fine too, you know? <laughs> it, it's really fun when there's no no reason, you know, it's not a yeah. rehearsal. It's not the, like we got to get this down for a, a show. It's just jam. Usually... We're just making stuff up as we go. It's like literally as low pressure as possible. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and I think most people probably started their bands doing exactly that. They got mm -hmm. together for a jam and then things developed from there. So see if you can get back to that original spot. Yes, exactly. That's a good thing. Um, you mentioned that, that sometimes we just have to remind ourselves of what we did when we started this in the first place. Like there was a certain feeling, a certain excitement, a certain thing we did that we loved. And and if we can bring that back, uh, that can only be fun. You know, I've heard this in other areas too, where with, when it comes to like personal development and stuff like that, where people talk about um, when you sort of, when you don't feel like you have a, a purpose or a vision for your life, or you kind of feel lost, you know, have a crisis, whatever. Then I heard this advice of, Uh, to to like think about what excited you when you were a child a child like things you love to to do when you were uh, little and and see if you can do the some of these things again or similar things or like bring back that that feeling because we have some natural you know things that that we just enjoy doing and we haven't really thought about it before we just do it did it automatically but as adults we kind of think we like overthink everything and with music it's the same when we were like starting our first bands as teenagers we didn't think about anything we just wanted to jam and, and have this band and and now we tend to overthink it all and if you can bring that back and remind yourself of how it felt like 15 years ago or so that can really help i think yeah kind of on the same topic of jamming is is the interaction you get with other people, jamming with different people. Um, and when you've been in a band for a long time, you kind of start predicting what the other person's going to do, which is really, you know, powerful and great in, in a lot of cases. But there's something to be said for jamming with different people because mm -hmm. it's that same thing as like learning a new song. You get exposed to just a different approach and different feel and different riffs, different whatever. And it, that can also be really exciting and fun, but also help creativity, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, more people in the room, uh, this is a thing that comes up in the outline here later too, is like, um, you know, it's just more fun with others usually and more ideas, you know, more, you know, uh, I don't know. It's just de definitely, it can, can unblock you and help you help you get rid, uh, overcome like roadblocks like that. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Go ahead, Malcolm, please. Well, I was just thinking that when... <laughs> I remember when writing with my band, every once in a while, like not every song is going to be a winner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes the majority of the songs won't be winners. Uh, and it, that can be defeating because not everybody in the room realizes that the song sucks. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's you that thinks it's going to be great, but you, you kind of have to get to the finish line to realize, all right, this one's a dud. Uh, but sometimes mm -hmm. even more painfully, I think, you know, it's a dud but you just got to suffer through and write the song anyways. Um, yeah. And you just got to be okay with that. You just got to like come to terms with not every song is going to be a hit. You just got to go through the process and realize that you are learning something even by writing a bad song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as weird as that is. Just try yeah. and enjoy the process. You're just making music after all. You can't like force a good song. So just go through it get the song done, uh, enjoy it, even if you're not going to play it live or even if you're not going to end up recording it. You never know one of those parts of that song might join, like be used in a good song down the road. So it might seem like a waste of time at the, like while you're writing it, while you're polishing this turd, but <laughs> it, it, might, it might end up being good down the, down the road. Absolutely. I had this a couple of times in the coaching program where students would like, if, like particularly one student I can think of without saying who it is, but he, he um, got frustrated because he wrote a bunch of songs and liked none of them. And he felt like he just wasn't able to write good songs. And he was like, felt like giving up, you know. And then we listened to his ideas on a group coaching call and we were like, and the whole group was like, in this song, 
this part is actually really great. And in this song, this idea, this part is actually really great. And we found a couple of these nuggets and then he was able to like put it together and, you know, they, he had a great song, sort of. Like he had a couple of starting points for, for a couple of great songs, actually. And he kind of combined them into something new. And so totally what you said there is so, so true. And in general, I mean... The, it's easier said than done, but don't be so hard on yourself. I don't, you don't, why Why would you deserve that? You know, you don't want to be mean to yourself and uh, you can be proud of whatever, of what you do and you're probably doing great. And And at the end of the day, what's the worst case scenario if that song is not great? Like, you know, no one's going to die. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it, it's not usually not that important. It is important to us, but it's not a life or death thing. It's not something to worry about or to something that we should really get to us, you know? Um, so, yeah. I yeah, think it's, it, it's, it's fine. It, it just is what it is. Like, time is obviously valuable, but it's also... The, in this particular case, it's just something we have yeah. no real control over. So you just got to just go with it, create, make make the process work. Um, yeah. just, just keep writing uh, and, and try and enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. And also the things that need to get done, because there will always be some things that are not as much fun, but they just have to get done. You can even learn to enjoy those too. Uh, something I always do with myself is I do a lot of tasks that I don't really enjoy, but I have to do. Uh, that's just part of, of my work. And as much as I try to automate things and outsource things, but there's still going to be something that I have to do that I don't enjoy. But you can turn those things kind of into a game. Um, and I try to always make it fun somehow, you know, I try to, to either I try to like score myself. I'm very, I'm a very competitive person. So I try to come up with things to just make it fun. And then you can also reward yourself if you have to, you can be like, okay, if I just get this done now, um, this is an accomplishment and then whatever, just, just something to make you feel better about it. Jump, something to get, to look forward to, to be excited about and, uh, just, you know, got to be a little creative here, but um, I think you can learn to enjoy even the tedious things. I learned that yeah. as a kid, actually, when I was ha when I had to do chores and stuff. Like, I always found a way to make it enjoyable, and you can do that same thing. Totally, yeah. That that's a great tip. Just you know, there's a way to kind of gamify anything. Um, you know, a bit, be it how fast you do it, um, coming up with different ways to do it, like whatever. There's there's a way to kind of make it less tedious and, and less annoying. <laughs> I, I think one another point that could be made on this kind of related to this topic is that if you realize that not everything is equally important or or like like we were saying, if not every song is going to be your hit. Um, not every song is going to be good. So don't think that you have to do every step of the process for every song. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, like we preach really good pre-production on this podcast a lot. Like if you're doing pre-production, you might as well do it right because those tracks might be like keeper. You know, you might end up with guitar tracks that are already done by the time you record the album. And that's amazing. Um, and you need to make sure they're really in tune. You need to make really good pre-production tracks. But you don't need to do that if the song sucks. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you don't need to yeah. record the song at all. I mean, you, you should record the song so you can just listen to it. But like, you don't need to do it in that way, right? So totally. don't think you have to take every song to the finish line. Because that, like, if you just know it's no good, there's no reason to spend all of that time on it. Yeah, so good. It's so important to know when to get out uh, and to... There's this, um, I can always think of like other areas where this where all of this applies. Like there's this, the sunk, I think it's called sunk cost fallacy sort of thing. Yes. Where people invest a lot in, into something and then they think they have to finish it just because they already invested so much into it. And what that leads to is they usually just end up losing m even more and it, because it never really turns into something. And that's the same thing. Just because you've invested time into a song doesn't mean you have to finish it. You can quit. Uh, and it's better to to quit early than than to to finish it, and it still isn't good, and then you've wasted even more time. But we tend to believe that we now have to do it just because we put so much into it already, and this is just a fallacy. This is not true. Yeah, yeah. Here, the, the example is: you buy twelve beer, you drink four of them, you feel great, and you just keep drinking all of them, and you feel terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to think about it too. Yeah, exactly. I gotta finish those because I bought them. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, knowing when to get out. Also, um, 
it, again, if you're not if if it's not your job and nobody's depending on you like writing music, and if you don't have to to show up like no, no then you don't have to show up if you don't feel like it. That's what I wanted to say. Um, you can, you know, it's probably okay to just you know um, do something else instead and come back later. It's it, probably not the end of the world, and um, it all depends on your goals, of course. But if you were working, if you've been working on a song for a while, it, it, it leads to nothing. It goes nowhere. The song is not good. Then just quit. And if if that kind of ruined your day and you don't feel like making music again now, just quit for the day and come back tomorrow. You know, if nobody, it's a different thing for like professional songwriters maybe when there are deadlines and stuff. But if nobody depends on you writing music, you know, throw away that song idea. Come back fresh tomorrow. Start something new. Absolutely. That that's like a great point. And you should think about that on uh, on like a schedule routine level as well. Um, figure out when creativity works for you. Oh, yeah. um, so like for, for me, I do much better work in the morning than I do in the evening. Uh, the idea of trying to write a song <laughs> or even record a song late at night just like makes me shiver. <laughs> there's, there's no juice left in my tank late at night. Yeah. I just want to be <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All totally. of my energy is in the morning and other people are the total opposite. So if you are finding yourself in that situation where you're tr like the, you've, the only time you've set aside for your uh, recording project, for example, is late at night and you just can't get results late at night, you got to figure out, you just got to wake up early and do it in the morning or fi figure out another way to get it into a more optimal spot for you. Totally. Pay attention to your natural rhythm. And it's interesting for me that I am the same. I have most energy in the morning, but I can do different types of tasks best at different times of the day. So for example, deep work that requires a lot of thinking and problem solving and like really a lot of energy, absolutely morning, um, strategic work, you know, thinking, deep works type of stuff. Um, interestingly though, creative things that don't require a lot of like really like thinking and brain power, but more of like intuition and just going with the flow. I'm better at that when I'm actually slightly tired already. So sometimes I find myself do better mixes or even like writing or just jamming away in the afternoon when I'm I don't have enough energy anymore to really overthink it and I just let it happen and and you know and I, I don't know that's a so creative things is for me sometimes better later in the day deep work stuff absolutely in the mornings and then whatever time is left I I do I use for just tasks that just need to get done you know like the 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 sort of don't think just do it you know type of work um there's always almost always room for that. But important is that you know your own rhythm. And also you'll have like ups and downs. For me, for example, I usually get relatively, yeah, sometimes in the afternoon I will start to get tired. And then, but then I find that in the evenings, like sometime after dinner, sometimes even, I get a second sort of high sometimes where I could do more work. Usually I try to still go to bed early and stuff, but I could do work actually at night after a certain, like after a certain break, you know? So I get that sort of second wind and another, you know, energy um, thing in the evenings. And you just have to pay attention to that and see when you do, when you're able to, to do your best work. And maybe you, you yeah. can spot a pattern, you know? Maybe you feel like, yeah, you're, that's right. Like the last three great songs I, I've written I've all done them, you know, Saturday evening or whatever, or wh whenever. And then, you know, that probably works for you. Absolutely. Uh, and different things for different times, like you kind of mentioned. Like, mm. I do my work in the morning, but I can study like crazy at night. Oh, yeah, um, for example. Like, yeah, that's I, a good one, too. I, me, too. That, that totally works for me. Um, yeah. So, you'll figure out what works for you. And it can change. Like, I used to be a night person. Now I am not. So <laughs> Totally. Same here. That's just getting old. <laughs> yeah, no, same here. You can absolutely change. I think staying consistent is more important you can change and then after a while of staying consistent you adapt basically and then you find a new you have some natural uh, like some sort of natural clock i think but yeah i think we, we can still Circadian adapt and, rhythm yes exactly exactly but i think to a degree you can change that and adapt um but you guys got to find out for yourself what's important is that you pay attention to it um then again collaborate with others um we talked about that before i just wanted to add that if there are things that you absolutely hate to do no matter what which time of the day you know whatever uh you just don't like it you can't turn it into a game it, you just can't, you just you know don't do it you just uh, avoid doing it 
just know that there are people who definitely who love doing the things that you hate to do. Believe it or not, there <laughs> are going to be people who love doing these things and who are good at it and fast at it and maybe not even expensive. And so um, collaborating is always a good idea to make it more fun and to make it quicker. And it's fun in general. Maybe it's not even a paid thing. Maybe you find a group of people that you just make music together, like in a band or an online collaboration or something. And more brains is like more creativity, more ideas, frequent feedback, outside perspectives. It's just fun. A certain sense of accountability also. And um, and yeah, that you know, you don't have to do all the things. If you can't find a way to make it fun, find somebody, somebody else to do it. Yes. Yeah. It, it, a delegation doesn't have to be a dirty word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody yeah. might be happy that you have assigned a job to them. Um, so it just, when you figure that out, it really levels up, like the, especially in a band situation. If you can delegate tasks across the band, it really increases like output and pro productivity. Yeah, totally. And the next one is really big for me too. That's the ultimate like reason for me why I want to to be in a band and especially on stage and have, feel that energy and like yell into the microphone and all the things I do in a, in a hardcore band is like. Um, Pay attention to, I think, your thoughts and feelings, certain events in your life and how you deal with those and use music as an emotional outlet and, and just pay attention to how good it feels to make music and, and rediscover that. Because music can be sort of a therapy, definitely. And, you know, it can be a way to communicate or it is a way to communicate. And once you rediscover how good that feels and what that does to you for your men for your mental health, it's it starts to become fun again. Definitely, that that's what what happened with me in with like my new band. The moment we started playing shows again, and I was able to just scream into a microphone and and jump around on stage and feel the energy from the audience and all of that. That was so good that I that that it made me want to be in a band again, just because that awesome. felt so good. So yeah, I think uh, that, that's really yeah. good. Um, Benny, can you book a show for when I'm coming to Germany? Can you? <laughs> That'd be really fun for me. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, uh, that's actually good. A good idea. Yeah, let, let's let's try to awesome. make that work. Yeah, <laughs> so so cool. Yeah, I would love to to see you there. So yeah, I think you know um, that is um, that is really that is really important. And like, if you're going through you know a hard time or whatever. Uh, maybe making music is exactly what you need um, to deal with that or to help you deal with it. So, and, and I think that's at the core of it, right? I think all art basically is sort of an expression of like the events in our, in our life and what happens to us and how we deal with it and how we want to communicate. That's ultimately what it's all about. So maybe try to reconnect with that. Then, you know, again, about collaborating, I think not only is collaboration good, but like show it to others and be proud of your work and don't be afraid to show it to someone because I think getting positive feedback on your music is really, really rewarding. It will boost your confidence and the more confident you are, the more fun you're going to have. And just know that your music is not only helpful for yourself, your music matters and might be life-changing for someone else. Like if you start releasing music and overcome that fear and show it to people, show it to friends... Um, you know, you you might not just get you know, um, good feedback. There might be bad feedback. I don't know. But in general, um, it, it feels good to put it out there, get feedback, and and usually, I mean, it depends. But usually, you'll get good feedback, at least from your friends and family and stuff. And and if you somebody's going to resonate with your music, and and the moment you discover that your music matters to someone else, that's definitely fun and definitely a confidence boost and just feels rewarding. It can be so rewarding. I've had somebody come up to me and tell me that like a song of ours has saved their life through a depression, yeah. which is like incredibly emotional and, and Think about so that. like yeah, like really mind blowing. They were yeah. like literally crying telling me this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. whoa, didn't expect that. <laughs> it's yeah. not what we set out to do and it's way better than what we set out to do, you know? Yeah. Um we've had people like send us like like drawings and paintings of us it's like you know like you don't realize how much what you create can impact somebody else because usually when we write a song it's because we're coping with something 
that we're going through, but it can it can be even more useful and powerful for somebody else, which is really amazing to think about. And that brings me to the next idea of reflecting on what you've accomplished and achieved with your music uh, can really remind you why you're doing it and just how rewarding it is to be doing it. So if you get caught up in you know the grind of of having to output and having to rehearse and all of these things and it's tiring you out if you reflect on like what all of that work has done it can really help remind you that like wow this is pretty cool that i get to do this and that it is impacting other people in this way or impacting you in certain ways as well um you know when i the memories i have of like our best shows is so valuable to me and it, it, I'm just so happy that those memories are, are there forever. Oh, yeah, to- definitely, totally. And you said a very important thing there. You get to do this, and you got to remember this. You don't have to do it. You get to do this. You could be, I mean, y- gratitude is a big thing here, too. You could be in a different situation where you would have to spend, you know, farming and hunting or whatever all day just to like survive or you could have to you know struggle to to get by and you know and would like there's so many people on this planet who who don't have time to do something like that and to be able to just to be able to have the time to create art and communicate and like that and express yourself like that that's a privilege and that's something we should be very grateful for and the fact that you get to do this and get to impact others with it and you're free to do this and you have time to do this this alone if if you put that into perspective is like makes it feel good i think it's um it's not something you have to do it could be way worse it's like something you get to do really and and so yeah it totally it really is even if it's not at the level that you wish it was yeah. you're still getting to do it at a level which is you know really yeah. a pretty awesome thing yeah and the world needs it you know we need art we need um to express ourselves we need this this outlet we like this is like culture is that's so important like imagine a world without that so um, yeah. you 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 the you you have the privilege to be a part of that and to get to com- contribute to that and um that is that is fantastic so yeah you know. is, is music taught in school in germany yeah it is they're they're trying to remove it out here and they have really? in some places it just i can't wrap my Blows head my around what evil mind. people are <laughs> yeah making these decisions it's like it, it's so dumb <laughs> blows my mind like the school that my daughter goes to is like they call themselves a, a musical like the literal translation would be a musical elementary school sort of oh, where cool. they um they focus a lot on music. They actually use music in all the other um, parts that they're teaching too, not just in music class, but like all the other topics that they teach. They they use music to do that. And um, they have a lot of like concerts throughout the year and a lot of projects that involve music. They use le- music as a learning tool. And, and it's so great. It's so cool. But the, the, what's so sad is that only a couple of people, like very few people actually think like, like us, like our family, and we uh, and support that. And a lot of people don't see the value in it. And they are trying to, you know, why do, why do these, like they're saying things like, why do these kids need to sing and dance all day? And they uh, should, aren't they supposed to like learn how to read and write? And like what, you know, they don't have to, they don't see the value in it. And I'm, I'm so grateful that they do it. And I see how good it is for the kids. I see how, how easy it becomes to learn other things and how valuable this is. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't see this. It's like from an academic standpoint, it's so good for like your, your brain and problem yeah. solving and, and memory skills and motor skills and 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 like pat problem solving and patterns it's like it's in, it's it's obviously beneficial in all of those ways <laughs> yeah. yeah but it's also this huge social learning tool it's a communication learning tool it's a coping like medicine uh, yeah. everybody in everybody on the planet listens to music like I mean, uh, of, co- of course, everybody that, uh, that has hearing ability listens to music, right? It- it's universal <laughs> in that yeah. way. So how could people not think that's wise? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I think the the music program uh, in in our schools in Canada is is ridiculous. Like it's it's a band, right? Like you know, big band mm-hmm. kind of format, which you know they probably average like less than a 
tenth of a percent of people that actually go on to be musicians that go into the music program, which is yeah. ridiculously low. But even that, I think, is still a good thing. It doesn't really matter if they end up becoming mm-hmm. musicians. Like the program could be much better, you know, yeah. <laughs> could be uh, something relevant about you know creating music that people actually like to listen to and that these students enjoy. But that's my own rant. The, yeah. Just the fact that they get ex- they have the option to be exposed to music is, is obviously so powerful. Yes. Period. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Totally. Blows my mind. And we're we're um, off topic. Things. Yeah. It's but also, no. That's but that's important. But that, that, yeah. No. But that's important. I'm so that's, worked up. <laughs> yeah. No. But it's that's like so, a huge Canadian export. Like we, it's a one of our. We, yeah. We get it. Like we have blo- Bieber and yeah. Shawn Mendes and yes. stuff in the weekend. It's like yeah. it's a huge Canadian export, and yeah. they don't invest anything into it. So yeah. dumb. <laughs> yeah. So dumb. Blows my mind too. Like, but yeah. I don't know, and but so um, yeah, back back Where on back, back on topic though, and it, it, it's kind of related though. And thank you for bringing that up, and I, I totally agree with everything you said there. Um, the next thing on the list would be for me that um, sometimes the fact that it's not fun at the moment is actually a good thing, or you can kind of embrace that, or just know that you will get through it because nothing really worth doing. Is, is easy, really. So the fact mm. that you have to work for it, you have to learn it, you have to put in some effort to get better at it, just means that it is something important and something worth doing. If it was easy all the time, you wouldn't actually enjoy it that much. And we really only enjoy those things that we have to work for. And, and so don't expect it to be easy and don't expect it to be like, um, you know, um, something that is just, you, you, you can do wherever and always feel good doing so. Um, it is good that it is hard and that it challenges you because then when you get through it and when you accomplish it and you write your first song, you really enjoy it. Imagine the difference between writing your own lyrics that mean something to you and getting that done versus entering a prompt into ChatGPT and uh, getting lyrics from that. In both cases, you would have a song and they would both be about the topic that you want it to be about, but which one would feel better and, and more rewarding? The one that you fought for and you know put hours into and it was hard to get to those lyrics, but then they mean something to you at the end. And this is just part of it. It, it, and it, it it's the same for every everything you do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, book recommendation: The Obstacle Is the Way. Can't recommend it enough. Yeah. Uh, such a good book that really drives this point home. But yeah, uh, yeah it should be hard. It's totally. Yeah. It's a good sign if it's uh, if it's work. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and also to trust the process and learn to enjoy this process. It's not ab- about the the results. It's about enjoying the small steps you take along the way and just trusting that if you keep doing that, you will eventually get there. It, like it compounds. It's like seems like small progress now, but you will get there if you just don't give up. And um, and then at the end, you will you will reap the the, the benefits and the rewards, and it's it's going to be awesome. Um, the next thing is also related to that, actually, and it's all, you brought up the the obstacle is the way by Ryan Holiday. He's a big teacher of like the the whole Stoic philosophy thing that I I love to to read about too. And one thing that the Stoics actually also say is I think is a Seneca quote is that we suffer more in imagination than in reality, and this is relevant here because oftentimes it's not really the fact that it is so hard or not enjoyable, but it's like the fear and the insecurity that make us feel bad or make it seem less fun. It's not that we really suck or that it's really too hard right now. We're just overwhelmed before we even try looking at this big project that we have in front of us and we're overwhelmed before we even start. But then when we finally start and just take the first step, we realize that it is actually doable and fun. It's some, so sometimes we just go through this whole project in our minds, suffering through it and like um, feeling bad and like that, that we suck and we get insecure and we think we can't do it. But it's actually not real. It's just in our imagination because we haven't even started. And, you know, th- there's this quote, I think, um, a Mark Twain uh, quote that I love where he says, uh, I, I suffered, I think he says something like, um, I've gone through like terrible, I've gone through many, many terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've lived through many terrible things, some of which actually happened. Yeah. So and, good. And that's, so good. Th- that's so good. And I find myself doing that all the time. You know, I have something in front of me and I, I suffer through all of it as if it already happened when it actually, I didn't even, I haven't even started. And right. it already makes right. me feel bad. And, you know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, I think an example that musicians could relate to is yeah. like 
you get together and jam with your band and you have fun. And you go play a show with like a ton of people in front of you and it's really fun. And then you play a show where there's like two people in the audience, it's an empty bar and it's just like terrible. You just like, oh, this sucks. Mm-hmm. And like they're, they're not listening, you know, or, or worse yet, you're a rock band and it's like a sit down venue. <laughs> yeah. People are just trying to enjoy their your dinner and you're like, yeah. oh, this is awful. <laughs> but there's no difference between that and your rehearsal space, really, right? When you yeah. think about it, why isn't it as fun as the rehearsal? It's just exactly. you and your friends on stage playing music and it's like it's entirely imagined that this is an awful situation you, you don't have to think about it that way you're so right yeah that's a, such a good example absolutely and actually i yeah it, yeah totally let's leave it like that i never i never understood <laughs> I I realize never really, that's easier said than done <laughs> yeah yeah but i also never i wanted to say that i never really understand and i never really understood bands who would um make it really obvious that they don't enjoy their show right now. It's such a weird thing to watch from the audience's perspective when I'm like, I mean, I'm here and I paid to see this or I, I made I made my way here. Like, I, I'm here to see this. Why would you not do your best now? I mean, I'm. it's not my fault that the others didn't show up, you know? And like, you always have to do your best and you, and it doesn't, it doesn't even have to suck, like you said. Like, you have fun. You should have fun just playing music regardless of the circumstances. And, and yeah, we, we all know the other perspective too. It's sometimes not as easy, but still, you should, I think. And um, with recording projects, same thing, you... You look at this when you do it for the first time, and you you for, you hear what goes into recording a song. For example, like the people who start the coaching program with me, and they see their roadmap, they see the phases of like producing a song or a record. Yes, that feels that can feel overwhelming. That's also the reason why I don't give people all the action plans at once. But I start at step one, and when that is completed, we do step two, and and so on and so forth. Because if you look at the whole thing it makes you want to give up because because it's so much that you have to learn. There's the gear aspect, there's pre-production, there's arrangements, there's recording, editing, mixing, mastering, consolidating, like all these things. Um, but you don't have to suffer through all of that before you start. You can just focus on the first thing and make that fun. And when you've done that, you can go on to the next thing. And each step is fun. Each step is different, a different challenge. And and so don't don't be so hard on yourself. And then the next one, you edit this, Malcolm, which is great. Um, also about fun, of course. Having a fun, a for fun outlet, what is that for you? Yeah. So, I mean, that could be anything you want. Some people like to go to open mic nights, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and just try out a new song or play a cover or whatever, or even just sit there and watch other people play. Um, yeah, it could be going to a concert and not performing. Could just have a, a group of friends you jam with that aren't your, you know, your serious band. It's just jamming for fun. Just have uh, an outlet that is musical that is purely for fun. That is the goal of this point. Um, and I totally wish I did more of this because uh, it like all became professional for a long time. And if I had, I think I would have maintained my relationship with music a lot. To a, to a lot healthier degree if I had a for fun outlet at the same time. Interesting. For me, it's probably my, my one band that I have is the for fun outlet because my job is the other part of it, you know? So I have this, this for fun outlet with my band. If you are in a band or you're making your own um, records and it's not your gig um, and you still, and you feel overwhelmed, then maybe you need a, a second like side project where we don't have any goals or it's just for fun, like Malcolm said. Um, but, but definitely the, the open night mic night or jam sessions. Yeah. We have, we have, there's a venue here in town where there's like frequently they, they just do, yeah. Open stage jam sessions type of thing. Um, it, Super awesome, uh, and and try. I would really make it a point to to not have any ambition or goal or anything there. Just let it happen and and just use it as a, as a purely for fun outlet. Really, yeah. That's the again the topic of this episode was music yeah. should be fun. Um, so just make sure you're finding ways to keep it fun. If yeah. if you're not if you're dreading your what what you're gonna have to do later in the day that like your musical hour if you're dreading that it's Mm -hmm. time to reflect on that and figure out why and and what can be done to change your perspective on that yeah malcolm did you ever with your band when you found some success and when you you know you were pretty successful with your band and like did you did it ever get to the point where this turned being in a band and making music back then like into something that wasn't as much fun anymore like I, I'm just asking because 
I never had that with my band. We, we, were, we, we were touring Europe, of course, and we had like a um, small record deal and all of that. And that was like very cool and definitely achievements. But it was, it was far from being a job. It was always a, a fun thing on the side. And we had some opportunities where we could have turned it into something bigger like and, and monetize it more and turn it into some sort of career. And I always was afraid of that, to be honest. It sounds like the dream, but I actually, I preferred to focus on the studio side of things. And I was afraid of doing that with my band because I loved doing it so much that I was afraid that if I turned this into a job, I might not enjoy it as much anymore. And then it becomes something I have to do and not something I want to do. And I could separate that with like the work that I'm doing for other people. I enjoy that too. But when I do it for other people, it's okay for me that it is kind of a job. But with my own music, my own art, I didn't want that to be a job. So my, my question again is like, did you ever feel like it was not as much fun anymore doing your own music once it turned into a career? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And and I it's it's honestly, I think that falls on on me personally. Um mm -hmm by not doing what we talked about in this episode enough. Mm -hmm. um, just not finding ways to keep it fun. There were things that I always would enjoy. Um, for example, the thing keeping me going was the the, the, the best shows. The, you know, the, the, the one out of 10 show where it's packed and, and just everything goes awesome, sounds great. <laughs> yeah. All of these requirements. Um, and actually, like, it, I wasn't alone in this. I know that other people have had this, but uh, I've talked with some other musicians about what I call post-show blues. Um, Benny, have you ever had post-show blues where something is so good and you have like so many endorphins that after it's gone, you kind of get depressed? Yes, for sure. Yeah. That actually is the reason why you get depression. Like after the same thing that happens with drinking, when people get the post-alcohol yeah. depression, you, you're so ecstatic while you're drunk that the next day is completely messed up because you, you have nothing left. The same thing can totally. happen with the show. Yeah, yeah, and and when you're touring and you have a great show and you get that rush and then you get this like quite literally natural depression after it because your body's yeah. just like I've used up all the happiness that was available. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and then you have like eight hours of driving across the center of Canada to a show with a grumpy bar lady <laughs> yelling that we're too loud and there's nobody there. Yeah. Like it like was just like shattering. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and it, in reality, like it's imagined, it's not shattering. Yeah. I'm yeah. getting to travel and play music with like some of my best friends and we're playing our own songs and stuff like that. And we just played a, a sold out show. We should be happy. <laughs> yeah, totally. um, But like that got really, really tough. And, and all of the other stuff, like... It, there we were trying to do it for real so there's like there's money on the line there's uh you know you're away from from your your loved ones for months yeah. and and uh like there, there's so many things to it the interband relationships can get really tense and stuff like that it's it's a lot of things that can make music not fun if you're not careful <laughs> yes Yes, absolutely, uh, to totally. And and some of these things aren't really a problem. There's reasons for that. And if you are aware of that, you can maybe, you know, breathe, control yourself a little bit, like know that it's not actually terrible and there's a reason for why you feel like that and then it's not as, as bad anymore. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Totally. Um, yeah, post-show blues. I kind of forgot about that until you asked <laughs> that question. Me too. <laughs> like that brings, up, that's, that brings back so many memories of like exactly yeah. those situations. And yeah. And in a so different, weird. like, yeah. on a different day, that same show where nobody's there would have been great fun, you know, or like there's mm. some reason still to enjoy it. But on the, on the wrong day, it's like shattering, as you said. Like, you yeah. Know. yeah, 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> um, just side tips on the post show blues thing uh, for, for people if you're listening and experiencing that. Obviously, people often drink at concerts including the musicians. Yeah. That doesn't help things with the post-show blues. It's <laughs> no. just like an amplifier to how terrible you're going to feel the next day. <laughs> and yep. sad. So, uh, so if you are recurrently getting this, stay sober, play the show, you'll play better anyways. Yeah. Um, it just, yeah, it takes practice playing sober um, if, if you're used to playing a little inebriated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, by the end, my entire band, like, we, we stayed sober for all the shows because it just was like, I can't perform uh, otherwise. Yes. And, and I think the feelings afterwards were too rough. Yeah. Yeah, I do the same too when I play. Um, this like I, I remember one, I have one show where I was really drunk and that was a disaster. Uh, it happened once and I played a lot of shows. Uh, and it, that this wasn't the reason that I stopped it. I didn't do it before then. I just, I don't know why it happened once, but it happened and it was a disaster. And other than that, I really don't, I don't do it. Um, 
because of yeah, many yeah, I mean, reasons. I also, I experience the show better. That's another thing. I can be more present, and if it, it like it's a different type, of, a more intense experience to me. Um, it is, yeah. I feel yeah. like the it's you know people drink b- before playing to calm nerves, but then that can actually kind of inhibit you in entering the flow state. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like kind of again embrace the suck and, and the obstacle is the way. If you're nervous, it's because you're excited. So yeah. lean into that, and you'll just explode on stage. <laughs> totally. You know the thing with those types of with that type of advice is though I just know that we probably won't convert a single person because what happens is the the ones who enjoy drinking and playing are like, fuck you. Like I, I yeah, do that totally. because it's part of it. And the others are like, yeah, I already know that. So that, that's why I don't drink. But I don't think that any of those people who drink will now be like, hmm, I know I will not drink anymore because they said it. But yep. maybe, maybe, Yet. maybe we, maybe there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just, no. uh, yeah offering my experience and and i mean i like i would often have a beer or whatever you know and yeah like it's just yeah, sure. just uh, i wouldn't lean into the alcohol it was kind of the change that happened as i played more and more yeah side effect and that is re- also a big one that affected um bands that i was in actually also like we all when we're like everyone's different but to a degree we all don't you know, we all change a little bit when we drink and we don't behave as well or we say things we don't want to say. And side effect, even if you're not turning into a complete dick, um, what still happens is that when you're talking to promoters and other bands and like people there, you the, you want to be in control of like the impression that you leave. It's so important for your band. Um, it can be, the, you know, the, the, the difference between getting another call or being, you know, getting on, on to tour with another band, you know, being booked to, for another show or not. Because if you, even if you don't, you know, become a complete asshole, it's just, if you're just annoying and, and don't, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, it can really yeah. affect your band in ways you don't want to, and you are going to feel bad about it. And you're gonna, um, you might even lose, you know, opportunities that you would have had, had you been sober. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, if you are a serious band, like you're doing this for serious aspirations, um, you've got goals. Being drunk at a concert is like insane to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. there, there's almost no circumstance that excuses that, um, both from the point of view of the audience you're interacting with, the other bands on the bill and the venue and show promoters as well. Nobody wants to deal with a drunk person. Um, it's, yeah. yeah, can't can't really make sense of it. Um, been there, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. But, of course. but uh, mm. it's, uh, yeah, we, we had rules about that for sure. There's like, there, and don't get me wrong, there's, you know, parties happen. So, you know, you'll, every once in a while, there'll be the promoter that wants to crack a bottle of vodka after yeah. the, the show is done and st- like stay up until six in the morning with the bar closed down with you. And that's a different s- situation, you know? Absolutely. Um, but when you're on the clock still, that's not the, that that's exactly. not the case. That's a total difference. However, the whole post show blues problem stays the same. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you will feel terrible if you stay yeah, up all night exactly. drinking with the bar owner. <laughs> yeah. But that can totally happen. And if that's a kind your kind of thing and everybody's on the same board there and like on the same page there, then it's all it's all good. Yeah, um, totally. So. Cool. Yeah. All right. How did we get there? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we went on a couple tangents. I, I dig yeah. into the Canadian school system. <laughs> we talked yeah. about running. We talked yeah. about drinking at shows. <laughs> we went all over. Yeah. Big I, I think I feel like it's a good one, though. I think it's a really yeah, good episode, fun. though. And at the end yeah. of the day, it's, it's about having fun. And so we have. Absolutely. We also get to get to do this podcast, and we have fun doing it. So. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. There exactly. you go. There's another tip. Start a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap this up. Um, if you got any value out of this, as always, please make a screenshot, post it on your socials, uh, tag at Malcolm Owen Flood, at Benedictine, at the Surf Recording Band, tag us on Instagram, reach out to us, um, share stories. We love to see those. We reply to those. We share your posts if you tag us. Let us know if this episode did, did help you. Uh, we love to hear like success stories, wins, and if, if that helped you overcome sort of a, a block or um find like fun again making music that would be awesome um to hear and yeah uh, we appreciate you thank you for listening to the show yeah thank you so much everyone we'll see you next (laughs) week week. bye